Welcome to Seat at the Table, where we believe technical skills will get you in the room, but your soft skills and business acumen will earn you a seat at the table. My name is Jared Beeson, and I am the host. You know, I've actually saw some, some recent studies and some recent communications that soft skills are now being called the power skills. Simon Sinek, one of, I don't know, one of the most influential minds in leadership, he refers to them as human skills. Call it whatever you want to call it. These are the type of skills we cover. And in each episode, our aim is to really equip you with the tools that will earn you influence and create opportunities for you through conversations that we're having with industry luminaries and leaders. Our hand-selected guests, they just bring a ton of value to all the individual topics that we're going to cover. And today, we have the incomparable Larry Whiteside Jr. as our guest. A few months ago, we connected and we've been trying to get our schedules aligned. And after considering various topics, we settled on one that holds a special place in my heart, metaphors and analogies. As some of you may know, we conclude every episode highlighting a favorite metaphor from our guests and occasionally I even share my own. But why are these communication tools so crucial? To what extent do we need to have these in our toolkit? What are the pros and cons of even depending on them? In today's conversation, we plan to dive into all of these questions and more, and we're even going to give you some of our own favorite metaphors and analogies. So, Larry, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. So happy to be here. I'm happy to have you, man. And before we dive in, for anyone that may not be familiar with you, can you take us back three decades and share yeah. a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so... um it's interesting when you say three decades, I'm like, wow, it's, it's been a while. Right. Um, uh, so I'm a former military officer. So I, I went to an HBCU, um, Houston Tillotson stand up, uh, very proud, uh, graduate of Houston Tillotson. And, and I joined the military. Now, I joined the military, not because I wanted to join the military, but because my grandfather, who was a Tuskegee airman, basically told me I had to join the military. Now, what I didn't realize was, the military had a lot of technical careers because uh, he wanted me to be a pilot. I had no interest, but when I realized that there were these technical disciplines in the military, I was like, all right, I'm on board. And that was really my springboard. And, you know, did that. I turned down major and got out, jumped into the commercial sector, private sector, and, you know, became a cyber, what was at that time an information security executive and have been, you know, just rocking and rolling ever since. It's been a fun, fun journey. I've been in a number of different verticals, healthcare critical infrastructure, you know, energy, power, oil and gas, all of that stuff. So it's been a, it's been a very, very wild, wild, but fun ride. Yeah. What I'm hearing is a ton of industries and a ton of metaphors and analogies that you've probably collected along the way, some industry specific, I would imagine, and some just right time, right place. And uh, dude, want to hop, just hop right into it? Yeah, let's go. All right. So before we hop into some of your metaphors and analogies, let's set the stage for why we're even having this conversation. So in your experience and the things that you've you know, worked on, what are some of the common challenges that CISO face when it comes to communicating with non-technical stakeholders? And how do metaphors and analogies help overcome these challenges? Yeah. So, so uh, I'm super glad we're having this conversation because this is the problem, communication. If you look at where the CISO started to where it's at today and where it's going, right, the CISO is becoming more of a business leader than ever before. Hmm. And with that, we've got to be able to talk in terms, but we also have to have some aspect of technical understanding so that when the technical people are talking to us in technical terms, we've got a mechanism to decipher or decode, right? Or you hire someone if you aren't technical, because there are a number of CISOs who aren't technical you have someone who can do that for you. But when you then get to the boardroom, when you get to the executive leadership team, when you start getting to your leadership peers on the business side, they don't wanna hear technical jargon. They don't wanna hear ones and zeros. They don't wanna hear, you, you know, it, 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 they need to, you need to as a CISO be able to speak in their language, right? 
Now, sometimes, though, even speaking in their language, there's no direct correlation from these technical things into their language. So that's where these, you know, coming up with different ways to communicate. And the reality is for me, I like to paint pictures for people. I like mm -hmm. to talk about things and give them examples of something as part of their real life. So any CISO that's ever put together a cybersecurity awareness campaign knows and has been told and has heard, hey, the best way to resonate with your people is to give them messages related to their real life. Because if you're giving them things that they can then apply at home, they're more likely to apply it at work. It's the same thing for a security executive when they are trying to talk to their peers on the business side, their peer, their leadership team, and the board of directors. No different. Now, I completely agree with you. And one of the things that, you know, really stuck with me a long time ago is I think it was Albert Einstein uh, said, you know, if you if you can't make something simple when you're trying to explain to somebody, and these are, this is me paraphrasing, then you don't really understand it. And so the interesting thing about metaphors is that is the simplest way to get the message across, but that means you need a deep, deep level of understanding about it to be able to convert it into something that would be palatable to, to the masses. And I think some people don't, they take that for granted. Making that message succinct and direct actually requires you to know far more about it than the, than the average person in many cases. Right, it does. Well, and the other thing is pictures, right? The, the term, a picture is worth a thousand words. That mm -hmm. wasn't made up. Somebody didn't just pull that out of their butt and be like, oh, this sounds cool. No, it's reality, right? When you look at something and when you can visualize something in your head, when you can paint a picture of something in your head related to a tough or deeply technical or, or, or this broad topic, it gives you much more clarity, right? And so it's metaphors enable mm. someone to paint that picture for someone else and for someone else to consume it in a way that they they visualize it. So it's, it's far better. Completely agree with you, man. I'll, I'll summarize it like this and then we can hop into some of your good metaphors. You know, metaphors and analogies are like the keys that unlock doors to understanding when it comes to business communication. They really help you transform those complex topics into relatable and impact messages that help executives make informed decisions. Executives aren't making decisions on things they don't understand. So it is your job to help them understand it. And metaphors and analogies are always the bridge to that, at least for me. Right. All right. So let's just hop right on in, man. In your experience, you know, give me some memorable metaphor analogy that you use to explain something complex to a non-technical audience. And how did it help them understand the topic better? Anyone you yeah. want to choose. Yeah. So my go-to is really always the one at the board. So so in my early days in the uh, mid-2000s, I went before the board of directors of a, of a global company and you know, I was having to justify the spin, right? Because, you know, cybersecurity, just like IT and a number of other functions, we are not revenue generating, um, right? And they didn't understand why I was asking for so much money and I couldn't go in there. To, and I was early in my, you know, understanding of how to communicate with the board, right? So I was asking for things because I had projects and initiatives that were going to align to my cyber program. And for them, they didn't get it. Like, they're like, that's not making us money. Why, like, why should we spend this? Why, like, give us some better justification. And talking about threats and talking about, it wasn't resonating. So I basically said, I asked the board, I said, okay, so I've got some questions for everyone here. I said, I need you to raise your hand. Raise your hand if you have health insurance. And everybody, of course, raised their hand. So raise your hand if you have car insurance. Everybody, of course, raised their hand. I'm like, all right. Um, raise your hand if you have life insurance. Everybody raise their hand. I said, all right, great. So we've set the stage that everybody's got all three of those types of insurance. So anybody plan on getting sick, right? Nobody raised their hand. I'm like, hmm, interesting. So, uh, all right, does anybody plan on getting into a car accident? Right? No, nobody raised their hand. So I said, anybody plan on dying tomorrow? Again, nobody raised a hand. I said, so that's interesting. I said, each of you is spending money on each of those three things, even though you have no plans of the event associated with what you're spending money on happen. I said, that's cybersecurity. You're spending money on cybersecurity, 
because it's about risk mitigation. You're not spending it because it's going to make your money, make you money. You're spending it because the money that is going to cost you if you don't have it is going to be exponentially more. So, and when I said it in that way, everybody got it. Everybody realized, well, yeah, because my car insurance, I paid, you know, $3,000 a year for car insurance for my vehicle. But if I were to total my car, that's going to cost me, you know, $60,000, whatever the value of the car is worth, right? Right. My health insurance, well, if I go to the hospital, I got to pay that out of pocket. That's going to be very costly. Life insurance, like burying me is at the cost, but like the cost, if I pass and my spouse is a stay at home mom and now she's got all these bills, she's got a house note and all these things, like what's going to happen? I need to have this thing to offset, right? So everybody immediately got it. And then we spent, spent the whole dialogue around that. And it actually, when I said it, it actually immediately helped me understand how to better resonate and communicate my ask associated with it based on the risk, right? And that's when I began talking risk. That's when I began to start talking at the board of, hey, I'm asking for these dollars to mitigate this level of risk. Here's the, here's the level of risk and the cost that will happen potentially if we don't do it, right? And so it, it was a very interesting conversation that went in a very positive direction, even though it started off going in a negative direction because everybody's like, I don't, I don't understand why we need to spend all this money. Man, I, I love that analogy. It is now in my toolkit. If I could virtually put it there, I would. And so, dude, you're spinning things up in my head and I just came <laughs> up with a metaphor just now based off of the one you had. So it's a slight vary on it. So <clears throat> if anyone's works in the organization, they've noticed that a lot of organizations have moved from pure healthcare to now wellness because wellness is actually cheaper for the organization, right? Them incentivizing you to get your daily, to get your regular annual health checks, them incentivizing you to like, like there are so many orgs now that if you can prove that you're not smoking, that you're working out on a regular basis, they will decrease your yep. actual healthcare premiums because they recognize that from an organizational perspective, it's going to be cheaper. And it reminds me of the proverb, uh, ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Yep. Right. <clears throat> I mean, that is another way to articulate the same thing that you're, that you're talking about. Hey guys, we're just trying to have a wellness program for cybersecurity so that we don't have that huge payout because this many people got cancer or, or this many people, you know, had obesity related issues and so forth. Right. It's right. the same thing from a, from a cybersecurity perspective. Well, you so, know, it's funny, right? So as it relates to that specifically, the rest of the world operates like that. Just in the States, we don't. <laughs> like it's, it's a very interesting economy of how we in the States see that com that real specific thing. And we've just started moving in the States to this whole wellness model that the rest of the world has been on. Because I know I've, I've had teams that were in uh, the UK and, and France uh, where that was something that they were doing. And I didn't understand why it wasn't happening here more than 10, 15 years ago. Absolutely. And I'll put a cap on this aim of the analogies. Um, people recognize that if you drink 10 Cokes a day and go to McDonald's five times, <laughs> you know, a, a week, you're probably going to have some health issues. It's it's inevitable. Right. People recognize right. that because we see it. We can touch it. It's tangible. We can see it on TV. We can see it around people walking around us. The same thing is for cyber, right? It's inevitable. Like something bad is going to occur. And as long as you acknowledge it that it is inevitable, it's not overhead. It's right. actually cost avoidance down the line, if you, if you want to look at it that way. I, I love that word cost avoidance because I've literally had, um, you know, when I've done consulting, I've had companies say, well, I'm too small. There's no such thing. There's no such thing as an organization being too small. There's no such thing as an organization not making enough revenue. If you make money at all, you are potentially going to be impacted by a cyber event, period, point blank. Now, you have to determine based on your revenue what your risk exposure is to determine how much you should spend on cyber. Because if you're a $10 million company, you shouldn't spend $8 million on cyber. Like That would make no sense. But 100%. you definitely shouldn't spend zero. 100%. Uh I've never done this before. Shout out to Elliot, Desiree, Donovan. You guys 
spot on. You guys are hearing exactly what we're trying to say here. Preventative care over responsive care, absolutely. And it's not overhead at the end of the day. Yep. Um, all right, so we went to some metaphors. Let's hop back into some questions around how you go about approaching this. So so we talked about a metaphor. It, it should work on a lot of audiences. All of you guys go use it in the future. Um, but before you get to the point of using a metaphor, what strategies do you employ to even gauge the level of cyber awareness among the different stakeholders that you're talking to so that you can adjust your communications accordingly to their needs? Yeah, so so for me, as an executive and as a CISO, for me, everything starts with relationships. As a security executive, as a CISO, if you are not spending a good amount of time of building relationships with your business leaders and your executive team, you're going to fail. doesn't matter how good you communicate because then you don't know necessarily what's most important to them. So for me, in my first 90 days, I will have one-on-one -on -one meetings with everybody that's a peer to me and above. I will also set a routine one-on-one -on -one meeting with me between me and everybody that's appeared to me or above, period, point blank. And the reason for that is, is A, it's building a relationship. B, I want to find out what's important to them. C, one of the big things that I do is, especially for business leaders who are leading large business units, I figure out how they are monetized, right? Now, what's that mean? That means how are they bonused? How are they, how are they incentivized, right, towards success? Because if I'm able to ensure that they are getting those incentives, if I'm able to show them how I can help enable those things to happen, right, and be more secure in those things happening, listen, I'm going to be their best friend, right? They're going to come to me with every new business initiative. They're going to come to me with every little thing. If I'm showing them how I can prevent risk to them potentially not achieving those incentives that they work very hard for. Because let's be very clear. Everybody works for a paycheck, right? Everybody does. But when you become a senior executive, it's those incentives that you work for. You are working for those extra incentives because those are the things that begin to take your salary to a next level, right? If you go look at, at executive salaries across the board, um, there are a lot of people who are making decent money, but when you hear when you hear people complaining about people making X amount of money, it's in their incentives. The, the way executive comp is incentivized on the business side is about revenue. The more money you make, the more money you make, right? And so the more money you make for your business, the more money that business is going to pay you. And so they are very willing to, and this is why they take risks and they take chances, and they're going out on limbs with different business ventures and things. But if you help them understand hey, if you do this in this secure manner, I don't want to stop you from doing this business initiative. I don't want to stop you from innovating. What I want to do is I want to help you innovate securely to mitigate risk downstream, right? And when you start talking in that way and communicating in that way where you're helping them understand that, hey, you're an ally to them to be not just better at, at uh, running their business, but at actually them ensuring that they make the money that they want to make, Listen, you'll be everybody's best friend. Yo, Larry Whiteside is dropping gems, y'all. This has nothing to do with <laughs> metaphors or analogies, but we're about to take this a different direction. Um, so, so the first big thing is you are absolutely right. Executives, myself included, we are incentivized with certain types of targets. We are incentivized with certain types of um, goals, OKRs, whatever they may be. It's not just important to understand what they are from a cybersecurity perspective is it's important to understand what things you're going to have them do. They can slow their progress towards that and how you can reduce that friction or at least get ahead of it. And right. also it's important to understand what bad things bad guys can do that can compromise their success in that regard. So maybe, you know, they need the system to be up at five nines. Well, then availability is probably a bigger deal than maybe even confidentiality, for example. And so you can right. prioritize what you're doing in their area within their sphere of, of influence to have a security system. And then you can articulate that. Hey, you told me it's important that this thing is up at all times. This is the $150,000 we need to spend to get you there. What are your thoughts? Right. Different conversation versus we need to spend $150,000 for security reasons. Go ahead. Let me add this, right? So timing is also everything. So when, when I'm building re these relationships, I'm talking to them about their long-term strategy. 
not just about what they're doing today. I'm talking to them about what is their 18 to 24 month strategy for their business? What are the things that they are trying to do? Are they trying to move to the cloud? Are they trying to, right? So I'll give you an example. So back in the mid to late 2000s, 2008 timeframe, right? You know, the the cloud wasn't a, a thing as it is today, but, you know, an organization I was working with wanted to start down this telehealth path, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the business leaders on the clinical side was going down researching, but now because she and I had developed the relationship, I knew the timing associated with when she was doing this. So six months prior to them even going down the path of, of looking at the different technology partners that they were going to utilize to do telehealth, I had already gone down the path of having uh, uh, an identity and access management conversation with an external vendor on how I can enable this piece to enable what she was going to be doing, right? So, so I got ahead of them. So by the time she came to the table with, hey, we're going to look at these partners, I thought, okay, well, here's the identity and access management uh, technology that we're going to use, right? I've, I've gone through, I've vetted it, so forth and so on. It's going to cost this much. It'll be added to your project. And this, this is how this will execute. They've got the, the biggest. Um, they've got the biggest open connectivity where they can connect with so many different people. Blah blah. blah. Went through the whole thing. She was like, "Okay, great." It wasn't even a question. She didn't question the cost. She didn't question. But because I came to the table and already had a solution based on the strategy that I knew she was working down, easy peasy lemon breezy. Now, had I come in right at the point where she's starting to vet vendors, I'm like, "Well, hold on, you got to wait until I can figure out how." Uh, we're going to do this from an identity access management. And then I push our timeline back 90 days. We'd have been doing like this the whole time. Yep. Yep. Nah, man. I, I'll give another example similar to that. I was working in an organization and we had a plan divestiture. People always think about M&A and M&A risk. Divestiture risk has its own set of risks, right? So I'm like, all right, well, if we're going to go through this divestiture, we need to double down on our DLP and our data protection and our identification of our data now because this divestiture was 18 months out. I'm like, that gives us yep. enough time to put the programs the processes and the technology in place right. so that we can actually identify the data that we want to give them <laughs> because we didn't even know how to separate our data. And when the divestiture time would have come, we would have had to give them some of the data we didn't want to give them because it was co-mingled with the data that was going to be rightfully theirs. So right. we can look to the controls and the measures that need to be put in place ahead of time if we are strategically aligned. But what happens, people find out, hey, we're divesting in a month, right? (laughs) (laughs) Because you don't have a seat at the table. You don't get to be part of that. And then you got to have this hard conversation of, well, if you do, we're going to open ourselves up to this regulatory risk, this legal risk, this so forth. Now, I say we don't do it, right? And now security is is the bad guy in the room. The opposite of no. We're like, oh, gosh. Yeah. (laughs) Absolutely. All right, let's hop back into some metaphors. That's what this show is about, so people came for. Um, yeah. We're going to play a game. I'm just going to throw out a cyber domain, and I want to see if you can come up with a metaphor. Got it. A- any, anything you can think of within the identity and access management domain? I'm giving you a, <laughs> softball. I'm giving you a softball. So so identity access management, there's, there's so many different metaphors, right? And, and most people use the house metaphor, right? Mm-hmm. Of, of, you know, locks on your windows and locks on your doors and so forth and so on. Um, for me, I'll, I'll use I'll use one that's that's real um, cars. So I don't know how many people, you know, most today, most everybody has automatic locks on their cars right now. But I also don't know how many people have proximity locking on their car, meaning if your key is within a certain distance of your vehicle, you can just push the button and it'll unlock. Mm. Right. So when it comes to identity assets management, and I use this metaphor because I've, I've actually seen this happen, right? Um, identity assets management, the purpose of it is, is to know who has access, right? When they're accessing it and that they're accessing the right things. But if you've got proximity locks, so it's, it's, if you've got proximity locks on your car, you have your key in your pocket and you're at a barbecue and you happen to be 50 feet away from your car, right? Do you want to give access to the guy who's walking by checking the cars, checking the cars because the sun just went down and that's what they do in the evenings, right? You, you probably don't, right? So when you're, when you're building out an identity and access management program, it's, it's very, very important to understand all aspects of, of, of identity, including proximity and location, right? 
we we don't often think about that. We don't often think about in today's aspect of, of identity. Zero trust is starting to give some visibility to it, right? Where people mm. start thinking about it. But proximity, right? Location, right? It's we tend to think, well, if they log in from Japan and then the United States, oh no, that's not possible. But if they log in from one IP that's at their home and then Starbucks is that. And so geolocation, proximity, those types of things as relates to identity access management is I think an unforgotten uh, or often unspoken thing that needs to be talked about a lot more. Because I, I literally watched on a, on a, a ring and I, I have ring at home and I don't know how many people have, but you have this ring community. And there was a barbecue going on at people's at, at a house and literally a dude went around to, uh, pushing the buttons on people's doors. And because of proximity locking, someone who was within a certain distance of the keys, dude went through their car, stole, stole a purse and wallet and a phone that was sitting in the front seat of the car. Oh, wow. Just because of the proximity locking. Whew. <clears throat> that's, that's a good one. Um, all right, I'm going to go with one from identity. Uh, since you talked about zero trust, I'll go with ZTNA. Right, so explaining a specific type of technology. Um, I liken it to uh, zero trust network access for those that aren't familiar. I liken it to the airport experience before TSA. So before <laughs> TSA, you would show your ticket, you would show your ID, you're inside the airport and you go wherever you wanna go. Sometimes you just show an ID and you're able to get in there. You just show a ticket and you're able to get in there because the assumption is you have the ticket, you must be the person. That's how it was before TSA, before 9-11 and so forth. Post 9-11, there are multiple checks before you can actually get to your place. People might ask like, I got my ticket. I had to show my ID to get my ticket. Why do I got to show my ID again to get past TSA? Well, because somebody might get past that first step, but it's gonna be a lot harder to get past that next step. But not only do you have to show your ID again, they're looking to make sure is his hair brown doesn't work for me. So we got to come up with something different, right? Is that looks like his face. Yep. Okay. Looks like his age, right? They're verifying multiple things about you to prove who you say you are. And then you're only able to get to where you're supposed to get. Right. And that is effectively what ZTNA is, but that's also how I explain it to executives. When I say, here's what I want to do you know, in the future. I don't want someone to just get in the room and they can go wherever they want to go whenever they want to get there. They have to prove themselves on a consistent basis. And if they're there too long, they got to prove themselves again. Yeah, I love that. That's So it's funny. So I used to, uh, how infrastructure used to be set up when, you know, in the 90s and, and uh, 2000s when we were always focused on perimeter security, right? I always, I always described it like an M&M. So you know how M&M, right? You get on and, and whether you chew it or you suck on it, right? You get past the hard candy shell, but then you got this nice, soft, milky chocolate milk, yeah. right? Or Cadbury egg, right? Like that's what we used to be dealing with, uh, right? So, so now though, it's it's more like a, a Tootsie Roll pop, right? Where where you remember the owl of the Tootsie Roll pop, right? Where he, he licks it. How many licks does it take to get to the center of a Tootsie Roll pop? And he, he licks it three times and then has to bite it, but it's still hard, right? But the reality is. We've now gotten to the point of creating things to be more like a Tootsie Roll pop where you can't just look like it's it's not just a hard crunch. It's hard all the way to the center. That's how I like to look at GTA is is it is hard all the way to the center. And you've got multiple layers that you've got to go through right before you can get to where you want to go. Mm. Love it. Love it. Of course, more analogies are popping in my head, but I want, I want to get through some of the questions I wanted to ask you while we have, while I have you on here. Um, <clears throat> all right. So so we, we've talked about some analogies. We talked about how you gauge, you know, the level of understanding and knowledge from the people that you're, you're working with. I, I'm curious if you can give an example of how you successfully persuaded someone that was skeptical about the importance of something specific in cybersecurity um, because of an analogy or a metaphor that you used without yeah. overwhelming them with a bunch of technical details, like I did with ZTNA, for example. <laughs> yeah, so um, I, I've got a few, and I'm, I'm trying to think of which one specifically I want to go to, right? So so for me, I, I'll probably go to um, when I was at an uh, uh, energy company, right? Um, so energy is unique. 
right? So, so with energy, right, we had dams and we had, we had um, uh, energy generation plants and we had all these different things. We had uh, natural gas plants and, and all these different things. And, you know, you're dealing with antiquated infrastructure that was purpose built to run for, you know, 50 years because it cost $25 million. So in order to secure it and right and, and update it and give it to updated software is not a, an easy or cheap task, so to speak. So when I started talking about, okay, we need to create some defense in depth and, and make sure that yes, because the environments need to be updated and need to be kept updated, but we need to find a way to ensure that we're letting the proper people on without and giving the proper people access. And so the the head of the organization and the head of our, our energy transmission, uh, I mean, energy generation business unit didn't like, he was like, I don't understand. Like, this is a lot of money, right? I, I, I'm not replacing things and you're still asking me to spend X millions of dollars, right? Mm. I, and, and so I had to tell him, I said, okay, so I need you to think about it like this. At your home, right, you've got, an AC unit on the outside, right? So technically, if your AC unit is not behind the fence, anybody can walk up to it and do whatever they want to it at any time. Now, in theory, you think you control it because it's sitting inside your home and that, oh, I've got a thermostat with which I just go to the, the thermostat and, and set the temperature. So, but the reality is because you have unfettered physical access to it, Anybody can come up and screw with your temperature anytime they want. I said, that's the same thing at, at our energy plants, right? And you think, oh, well, because it's nobody's just going to walk up to my house. Like, why would someone do that? My neighbors will see, or, or I, right? No, but, but that's a reality, right? When, what, so for me, in this particular instance, I was dealing with our dams. I said, you know, people can walk up to any of these facilities, right? where there's power generation because it looks cool, right? This, there's water around. There's nothing stopping people. You think a rope is going to stop people from just swimming under a rope? How many people have swum past a buoy out at the ocean or in the pool, right, where they've got a buoy there that you're not supposed to go? It happens all the time. I said, so you can't look at human nature and say people aren't going to because curiosity killed the cat. I said, so because of that, we've got to put some protection measures in place. And I said, yeah, it's a few million dollars to put these cameras in place. It's a few million dollars to put these protective measures in place. It's a few million dollars to put locks on certain doors and put, the, I said, but you're basically doing that to stymie the curiosity of the general human. I said, I said, because you've got this big thing out in the middle of nowhere. I'll give you an even better one. <laughs> I just remembered this one. So being part, uh, being part of an energy company, you have gener uh, um, energy transmission, these substations. So everybody lives in a the neighborhood. There's a substation that powers your neighborhood, right? So yep. but if you think about it, those same substations live across the country in some very, very, very rural areas where there may be nothing for miles but they have to have a substation because it has to be able to push energy. It only, it's only so far that it can be transmitted before it dilutes, right? So you have these energy substations so far apart. So one of the, another big project initiative was putting, um, putting uh, LTE into each of the substations because I needed to pull data back because I couldn't run wires out there. I couldn't, you know, get network connect, but we've got stuff out there that needs to be, I need to have wireless cameras out there. I need, but I need that data to be able to come back so it can be seen by my physical um, security team. And they're like, well, well like why? I said, listen, do we want to wait until an alarm goes off that someone has, has actually broken something or something? And now we've got a, it's going to take us, you know, X number of hours, even though we've got a partnership with the local police force, even for the local police force, their nearest person is going to take them 45 minutes to get to that substation in West Texas. No, like we want to be able to, prior to the event happening, understand, hey, there's a truck that's pulled up and stopped at the station. Looks like they're, let's go ahead and get somebody dispatched out there now. So that if they happen to do something, in the time that it takes, we've actually 
already reacted and already responded to start getting people out there. I said, it's about risk mitigation. And so they didn't understand it though, right? And, and, and I used the analogy, I said, so um, I said, you walk your child to school? They were like, well, no, they catch the bus. I said, okay, so, so your child gets on the bus. Do they have cameras on that, on that bus or does the bus wait until an event happens and then the bus driver then calls in the event and then he's like, no, no, absolutely, they have cameras on the bus. I said, well, why do they have cameras on the bus? I said, because they want to know what happened and they want to have visibility of what the incident is. I said, exactly. I said, so you as a parent don't want to just hear it third party from someone else. You want to be able to see what the incident was that happened so that you actually can then make the best determination on how to protect your child moving forward. Do you put them back on that bus? Do you not? So for these substations, right, we want to know exactly what the incident is because we got to deal with the federal authorities, right? And they're going to ask a lot of questions. If we've got no answers to this, right, then we're going to look a little silly. And we can't protect against things we don't know because then if we see multiple times that someone is stopping and because we've got a big sign and this is reality, this happens, we've got a huge sign that they use for target practice in this particular uh, uh, area of the state, maybe we need to take that big sign down and put smaller signs up, right? Like it's, it's those types of things that people just don't think through. And it's, it's, it's interesting. I, I just remembered that. And it was a long conversation until I got to that analogy about having video of an incident with their child on a bus versus not, and what the impact is of not having that video to be able to make a better decision on how, what you're going to do with your child. I said, we've got 400 plus substations across the state. Like, dude, <laughs> dude this is, this is masterful communication and probably not for the reasons you're thinking, but let me break down what I heard. Number one, Cameras are the key to articulating why we need logging, why we need packet capture, why we need <laughs> all these things, right? So, so cameras. But what was masterful is that you brought in their kids. You brought in emotional aspects. You made them think, how would I feel? My kid gets hit and no one can really tell me what happened. Or my kid has something stolen from them and come home with all these marks on their body. And we know what happened on the bus, but no one can tell me what happened on the bus, right? That creates a visceral response 100%. that then translates directly to, okay, yeah, we don't want that feeling with the CEO or with the CFO or with our regulator. Or, or, or with the FBI. Like, the FBI, get, with, with our with The our head customers. of the field office coming down, right? <laughs> our customers in that area, right, who pay for these transmission lines. Oh. I yeah. hope I don't get in some, some, some dirty dog duty here, but uh, Microsoft <laughs> can't tell you how their keys got stolen. Like they can't tell you how the keys got stolen. Like the camera analogy is like, hey guys, we don't want to be a week later not being able to say we don't know how this occurred. Granted, well, they're and, big enough, but smaller companies, they can't take that hit. But this is the entire visibility conversation that our industry has been having now for 15 years. If you think about the sim space, the sim space started because we said we can't manually do grips and logs of every system. So we need to pull all the logs into one thing, right? And then we said, crap, there's too many logs. We can't, we can't hire enough people to freaking look at all the alerts that are going off in the sim. So then the entire SOAR thing happened, right? Now we've gotten to this point of SOAR is not even enough, right? Because it is taking on some menial tasks, but there's still level three SOC analysts are still losing their mind because of the amount of data that they're having to dig through. So now you've got AI, where now AI is being integrated into the SIM platform to even take this automation further. But it goes down to visibility. We need, from security standpoint, we need to see everything. Every component of logical technology and data that you have, no matter where it's at, we need to look at it. We need to, we need to understand it. Who's got access to? We need to look at all the access files. We need to look at all the data trails. We need to look at everything so we can correlate to create a picture. We create this visual image of what the hell is going on. And that's our number one problem in security is, is we still have not holistically been able to get the visibility, right? Now, I've owned both physical security and logical security in a couple of roles, and physical security, they understand visibility, right? Because it's physical cameras. Right. But on this logical side, on the on the technical side, 
you, you mentioned visibility and they still are hemming and hawing and we, we are still fighting that battle and it drives me absolutely bonkers. And so I use physical sites, right, on, as it relates to logical things on a regular basis. The, the number one metaphor framing I use is always physical. There's a house analogy, there's, there's walls, there's, you use cameras, there's guard dogs, like, like all of these things have like correlations. So our time is running out here. I'll go, I'll continue with your camera analogy. Um, one of the things beyond getting cameras in the, in the buses is making sure cameras are in every bus, right? So, okay, we've agreed we're going to put cameras in buses. Let me give you a, a monthly report of the amount of buses I'm aware of we have and the amount of buses that have cameras that I'm aware of we have, right? So instead of saying coverage is 75%, I might right. have a freaking picture of buses. There's four buses I know about, and these three are covered. This one isn't. Sure, hope your kid isn't on that bus, right? <laughs> right. Listen, I, I'm gonna like, tell that, you that's that's where that's where it goes. Uh, it's so so. Uh, a lot of this though also comes back to um, people's lens. So I, I, I use lens in in uh, in in the term like perspective, people's lens, their perspective based on who they are and where they came from and all these things drive different understandings of why they, and this is why we use these analogies, right? And so I'll give you an example. So at my home, there's not an inch of my property that you can come on to where you're not being seen, period, point blank. There's just not an inch. Now, I do that, right, because of how I grew up, my background, my lens, and so forth, right? My fiance, on the other hand, did not understand it. I have the same type of dialogue inside cyber, where coming up in cyber, understanding all the threats, understanding that threat actors don't care how big or small you are. They just want to make money, right? They're going to come at you from every way possible. So for me, I need to see and understand the entire scope of how we are doing business from a technological standpoint, so I understand where we're deploying things, where we're not, who our third-party partners are that we're doing business with, that we're sharing data with, because here's the reality. If a third-party partner loses our data, guess what? The, the people whose data it is, right, if it's customer data, if it's some aspect of regulated data, the regulators are going to come to us. They're not going to go to the third party and be like, hey, you were a partner with Larry's company, and we, we can't believe, no, they're going to come to like, hey, Larry's company, why did you lose that data? How did you lose that data? What did you, oh, I didn't know we had that data. I didn't, that's not a good answer. So for me, I have cameras that cover every corner of my property because I want to see. So if something happens, I've had visibility to it. Same thing in our, in our uh, technology organizations, right? In our businesses, we need to have visibility so that when that thing happens, we, even if we didn't see it when it happened, we've actually got the data assets that we can go pull, sift through, and do forensics to say, ah, 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 okay, mm -hmm. we understand what happened. We didn't really have this tuned properly. We didn't really have, right, understand the correlation of these types of things, right? Those things are the things that are important. And so, which is why it baffles the Jesus out of me that today, <laughs> in 2023, one of the fundamental things of any cybersecurity function is know what you have. And so few companies do not still today know all of their assets. And this is with the fact <laughs> that asset, the definition of asset has grown where it used to just be a piece of technology. Now we're talking about data as an asset. Now we're talking about APIs as assets. We're talking so there are so many different things now as assets, and we still don't have any clue holistically on every asset that we have in our organization. It is maddening. It, I mean, that is an entire episode in itself. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> NIST, CIS, ISO you name it, the yeah. number one control is always asset management. And yes, the definition of asset has changed to SaaS, cloud, identity. I mean, the list goes goes on and on. 
All right, so we have exactly 15 minutes before I get in trouble for going any longer than that. So here's what I want to do. Um, we're going to play a game with you guys in the audience. Drop a cyber domain. We'll pick one, and we're going to come up with an analogy on the spot uh, for that. Um, and in the meantime, I'm going to... Um, I'm going to ask Larry for one more domain specific I'm going to ask for. And you guys throw something in the comment and we will we will try to come up with one on the spot. And that's how we're going to go out. There will be no there will be no sign off. There'll be no in that because usually I sign off with the metaphor and analogy dropping a ton of them here. So <laughs> we're going to answer one of yours if if we have time. But in the meantime, uh, let's go with let's go with the more recent move it incident. So. How would you explain move it to your board, leveraging a metaphor or analogy? That's a tough one. I didn't dig into the move it breach. Tell, tell me what happened with the move it breach. Supply chain. Any supply chain breach, right? Oh, any geez. any supply yeah, so. chain breach. Like your your supplier is compromised. So now as a result, you can be compromised or you're at risk. How do you how do you articulate that? Yeah. So um, <clears throat> you know, we so if, if I'm going to my board to explain that, I, I'm literally basically saying, listen, so uh, we had third party entity um, that had access to a uh, certain component of our data with which we were not governing. Right. Uh, and I would say it's akin to you giving your neighbor a key to your house and, and never getting back, never asking or understanding, but not giving it specific access to a specific door where you've got a camera in your mind. Like we've just given the neighbors, the keys, and just trusted that, hey, you know, they're going to do what they're supposed to do. And it, it's it's a bad thing. This the whole third party risk management thing. It's a humongous, humongous issue that we still haven't gotten down properly. Now APIs have exacerbated the issue to the nth degree even more. No, I completely agree. We're, get, we're getting some good ones in. So I'm going to I'm going to go Ooh. off with one first one that I see here and you can add on to it. But someone asked, why does the security department keep needing money for protection year over year? So here's what I use. Oh, perfect. Our producer, <laughs> Stephen Hart, if you don't know him, follow him. Extraordinaire. He's the one who puts, puts all these on. He caught that pretty quickly. Um, I always like to tell my executives that we are on an escalator that is going down <laughs> and it is. That is the way it works. They're adding more threats. To your, you're adding more technology. You're adding more complexity. You're adding more people that I have to train on a regular basis. The list goes on and on. So our escalator is constantly going down. And if we just spend the bare minimum, we can stay exactly where we are, right? And that bare minimum is spending something more than we did the previous year. If we spend exactly what we spent the previous year, then we're going to stay on that same step and we're going to continue to go down and our maturity is going to go down. You just can't yeah. stay stagnant in security just to be at the same level. And if you want to improve, then we're going to have to spend even more than that and spend more time and more resources and energy. Just like if you're trying to walk up an escalator, it's not going to be easy, but that's pretty yeah. much what cyber looks like. Yeah. So, so I, I love <laughs> this one, right? So for me, it's this, it's, it is, um, there is no aspect of, of, things that stay the same. I said, so you don't drive the same car, right? You, you, your car lasts you a certain number of years and then technology comes out that is more innovative and better. And so you spend more money on the car, your next car than you did the last car. So, and then, and that continues to happen. And the threats associated with that new innovative car are greater. So you are now also spending more to enable all of these other things. That's where security is at. Security is an enabler for everything that we do from a business and technology perspective. So as you see new innovative technology come out, there are new innovative threats associated with it. We didn't build, we are building the ship while we're floating. Mm. Like it, it's so, so it is, it is the equivalent of, of being in the ocean, right? On a canoe, as the water gets deeper, you now got to make that canoe uh, a boat, and then you've got to make that canoe a yacht, and then you got to make that canoe a tanker, and the ship keeps having to get bigger because the waters are getting deeper. Yeah. Yeah, I like it. Um, <clears throat> another one came in for cloud native security. Uh, I'll let you think of one while I come up with one here. So. There's a few ways I could take this. I'm going to, so there, there could be a pro for cloud native security or a con for cloud native security. I'm going to go with the pro. Feel free to come with the con if you really want to come on top of it. But uh, so for cloud native security, um, 
I liken it to the process of if you're going to build a house with a builder and it's a builder that builds a bunch of different houses, they're going to have the lumber at a cheaper price. They're going to have the same granite options. You can choose either this granite or this granite. You can choose these cabinets or these cabinets. And it's cookie cutter. Um, so it's nothing special per se, but it's good enough. And it's going to be cheaper. And you're going to get there a lot faster. And you're going to have more confidence because you have a larger cloud provider behind it. Now, um, what you're not going to get is the extremely custom solution. You're probably not going to get best of breed. Um, but that's not what you go for for cloud native security. You go for the thing that is closest to the technology um, that you're that you're trying to protect. And so I would use an analogy similar to that. Or I will go this route, which some people may not understand. Microsoft is typically not the best at anything that they do, but they give you so much stuff together that it makes a lot of sense. So going back to Microsoft Office, they never had the best word processor. They never had the best spreadsheet. They never had the best presentation solution. But combined, you can't beat it. And that is kind of what uh, cloud native security would give us if we decided to go that route. Is how I would use it. Yeah. So, so for me, I, I use, I use a, a, a suit option. So you can buy a suit off the rack, right. And, and, you know, these buying the suits off the rack is, is okay. It's an option. Right. Um, but the difference when you're going cloud native, it's a custom fit suit. It was purpose built for the cloud, right? Cloud native yeah. tools are purpose built for the environment within which they run. Right. And because of that, it's going to fit to a T. It's going to be the exact measurements. It's going to it's going to feel. It's going to flow with whatever curves you may have in your body because it was purpose built for that environment. Right. That's when I when I think about cloud native versus if you are a heavy cloud provider, something that's purpose built for the environment within which you're running is just going to be better integrated. You're going to have less hiccups. You're going to have less less o overhead because there's going to be less stress associated with configuring, configuring and managing it holistically. Now, to your point, uh, when it comes to cloud native versus cots off the shelf, you know, on premise, there's this whole best of breed versus ease of management, right? Figuring out which one you want to go. Best of breed is sometimes if your threat is high enough, you may want to choose best of breed. But in many cases, to your point, uh, when you are going with cloud native, you are getting a bundled solution that holistically provides you better holistic protection because again, they were purpose built together and integrate together far more easily than bringing in a third party tool and bolting it on top, just like Legos. When you build a Lego car, right? And remember, there were different types of Legos. So you had the one from Legos, and you had that generic Lego that sat off to the side. You couldn't just build Legos and then easily make a piece from this other Lego set that wasn't really Legos fit because it didn't fit. So you could sort of force it and push. If you push hard enough, it would end up clicking down, but it wasn't the best fit. It's the same thing, right? You can have a third-party tool, and, and they will make it work in your cloud environment. But a lot of times those ones that have been purpose built for it are just going to fit and work more smoothly together. I think we're gonna wrap it up with that. If they have kids, use the Lego analogy. And if they are <laughs> someone with nice shoes, use the tailored suit analogy. But uh, that's how you communicate those very complex topics to a non-technical audience. And it just makes sense. Thank you guys for joining. Uh, Larry, we got to do this annually. I think this is something hey, let's, let's make it happen. that the community needs. Uh, and this is a yeah, seat at the table.